Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this presentation um, on the RGW subsystems with a uh, focus today on the workflow, the request workflow. Um, today, we're going to build upon the last RGW presentation by talking about some of the features and the subcomponents sub of the RGW itself instead of just telling you what it basically is and how, to, and how you can interact with it uh, very simply. Uh, this presentation is meant for uh, new RGW developers and it'll kind of finish off a foundation for developers on what the RGW is. Um, and future presentations, which I'll talk to talk about at the end, uh, we'll go into some of the subcomponents that we touch on um, and talk about them in depth. Uh, I ask that you can uh, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, and I want to remind everyone this is recorded, and I'll share the link once it's ready later today. Second. A uh, quick refresher from the last presentation. Um, as you can see, uh, here is how the RGW fits into the overall picture of Ceph. Uh, S3 and Switch clients know about the RGW endpoints and interact with RGWs using HTTP. Uh, the Rados Gateway admin uh, talks to the OSDs using Librados and creates uh, users and credentials for the S3 clients to do operations on the RGW with. Uh, once the clients have uh, read and read, or sorry, uh, write and read to the RGW. Uh, those objects go into the OSD using Librados uh, with the CLS uh, providing RGW uh, a richer set of Librados features. And finally, the monitors know about the existence of the gateways and the OSDs and the entire cluster itself. So the RGW itself has numerous subsystems, um, and this is, th this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the bigger subcomponents and parts of the code base that we wanted to just touch on today. Um, the first one is the front ends. Uh, RGW has two front ends uh, or web servers. One of them is Civet Web. And that's a sub-module in the source tree that's a fork of the open source project with Ceph's own uh, patches applied to it. Uh, the second is Beast, and that was written by Casey Bodley, the RGW tech lead, uh, and that's based off the Boost ASIO library. Um, the RGW has a common framework for doing many different types of authentication. Uh, that is an entirely different uh, presentation in and of itself, but we're going to touch a little bit more on that later today. Um, the RGW has uh, structures in place uh, for the operations that both the S3 and SWIFT protocols implement. Um, and S3 and SWIFT specific uh, versions of those operations are in RGW REST, S3, and SWIFT. Um, and those operations inherit from a base class of operations in rgwop.cc. Um, uh, admins can set policies on buckets um, and uh, for how long they might exist or what kind of uh, permissions you'd want to set or uh, many other things. Um, the Rados object layout um, in rgwredos.cc, it uh, ex goes over how we map uh, S3 and Swift bucket and container object and bucket and container uh, and object concepts to Rados. Uh, for multi site, uh, Ceph monitors use Paxos, um, and all clients have to talk to the Paxos to the monitors, but Paxos doesn't work well over wide area networks. 
So since you can't have one Ceph cluster running over two cities, you have to have two Ceph clusters and multi-site replicates the data back and forth instead of just being one store. Uh, garbage collection runs in the background deleting objects and it makes our deletes look fast because we delete the head objects and then delete the rest in the background. Life cycle um, is a Another set of rules you can set on a bucket, and there's two types of life cycle rules. There is expiration, where you set a life cycle rule on a bucket and say that it will get deleted after, let's say, uh, X amount of days. Uh, then there's also a transition, where you set a rule that says, uh, after uh, X amount of days, we want to move this bucket from one Rados pool in another in the RGW implementation or uh, in Amazon in S3 you'd move it from S3 to Glacier. The Red SGW admin, um, it, it encompasses the, the admin command, which is a tool that allows you to interact with uh, different features of the clusters uh, without actually going through the RGW. And then also um, there's a NFS plugin for NFS Ganesha that allows the RGW to do NFS. Uh, today we're going to touch on a lot of the some components I talked about before. Um, and we're going to go through each of the steps in this workflow. Uh, and just to refresh, just to give everyone a high level overview, uh, S3 Swift, S3 and Swift clients send requests that uh, are in the to the RGW front end. Uh, the RGW front end has a function called process request, which uh, is, yeah, it, it is a main function for the request. Uh, and that's what triggers uh, or what, where, where you go into the auth engine from and also where you get the op. Um, and it, within the RGW op, it calls things in RGW Rados. And then within RGW Rados, we see actual calls to libredos. Uh, to get us started on the, to give us more in-depth information on the front ends, I'd like to turn it over to Casey. All right, thanks, Ali. You guys hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you. All right. So, like Ali said, um, the RGW front end is the kind of the entry point of HTTP requests. S3 and Swift are both HTTP based. Um, if you're familiar with web development, you probably think of the front end as the thing that sits in the browser as the client side. But for RGW, we're the HTTP server. So we think of the front end as the, the server part that accepts incoming client connections um, and knows how to read and write HTTP requests and responses. So there's a couple interfaces in RGW that uh, the different front ends use to implement this. There's the RGW front end, uh, which is created on startup, and it just knows how to start and stop the server, find to a socket, uh, read some configuration. There's also the RESTful client interface, and that's uh, created for each request. And it's an interface exposed to lower levels um, just for reading data from the socket and writing the response back. So we've got two implementations. There's the Civet Web one, which is a, a C web server. Um, and it's been around for a long time and it has been stable. Um, there's a, a newer front end that uh, just in Nautilus became the default called Beast, and that's a C++ one um, based on some boost libraries that can do asynchronous networking. And uh, so yeah, the, the front end is where each request comes in. And the next step after reading a, a request is to pass it into the process request function. So back to Ali on that. 
Uh, yeah, as Casey mentioned, um, each of the front ends call into process request. Um, and at a high level, process request gets a handler. Um, it does the aux, the, does the auth steps. Um, it then executes and completes the opt. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump into it uh, and give a quick overview of the function itself. So uh, starting on line 182, we can see the logging, for those of you familiar with actually looking at an RGW uh, log file. This is where the logging indicates a new request is starting. Um, there is this function called get handler, uh, and depending on the path that you request to the RGW front end server, uh, get handler is going to determine which REST manager we use, and then the subsequent uh, handler to go with it. Uh, going down, um, we see that the this logging line right here where it says getting op um, will show the HTTP op that's emitted, like a put or a get. And uh, depending on which handler you got, um, handler get op is going to return the protocol specific handler. Um, it could be Swift, it could be S3, uh, but that is how the protocol specific op is uh, passed out. Then in 250, um, the verify requester is run, and this uh, interacts with the clients to make sure that the clients uh, have the appropriate credentials. Um, and in process authenticated, this is where permission checking happens, um, where S3 or Swift check for bad parameters or headers, uh, and then the op is actually executed there. Then finally, um, on 284, uh, the client is actually completing the request. And so this function. Uh, more or less encompasses or kicks off all the steps uh, for the lifecycle of a request. Uh, and I'm going to pass it back to Casey uh, to talk about some of the auth engines that uh, can be called, called into uh, end process request. All right. Uh, so the, the common auth engines are the local ones, um, which are based on users that are created with Rados GW admin and stored in Rados. Um, so when you create a user, it generates credentials for it, and the S3 and Swift clients use those credentials to assign the requests. So the local engines are the ones that are uh, checking those signatures to authenticate users. Um, there are external engines like Keystone, which is used in OpenStack for Swift. Uh, we're working on a new STS engine, which is a secure token service, which uh, does more flexible and AWS compatible authentication. And there's, there's an LDAP engine also. So the auth engines are responsible for authenticating requests um, and also representing the identity of the users that it authenticated as a class called identity applier that uh, the rest of the request flow can check uh, with respect to who the user is and what their permissions are. Back to you, Ali. Um, uh, for the op slide. Ah, I'm doing this one too, aren't I? Yeah. Excellent. 
Uh, so process requests is called into the auth engine and authenticated a user at this point. And so uh, process request is um, figuring out which which app to execute. Um, some examples of apps are things like creating a bucket, listing a bucket, uploading an object, downloading an object, um, and all kinds of other things. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, app-based classes in rgwapp.h and cc. And um, for things that we need to specialize for SWIFT and S3 protocols, um, basically parsing special headers or special request formats and um, formatting the responses for those. Um, that special stuff happens in RGW REST S3 or REST SWIFT. Uh, so the, the steps of an operation are generally to uh, check the permissions of the user against the operation they're trying to perform. Um, there's an execute function, which generally calls into RGW Rados to perform the operation, and then it sends the response at the end. And so RGW Rados is kind of the, the back end for um, RGW that uses the Librados protocol to actually perform the, the operations. And uh, basically mapping the, uh, the Swift and S3 view of buckets and objects to the ones that we store in Rados. So some of the key concepts here are um, bucket metadata, which is about which buckets exist in the system, what their attributes are, what policy they have attached. Uh, there's also a bucket index for each bucket that contains the list of all of the objects that are contained in it. And uh, buckets can get really large, so we have a strategy for sharding the bucket index across several objects so that it can be spread across OSDs. And we have a, a dynamic resharding feature that can do this at runtime. And uh, Ali touched on the CLS modules, which we lo can load into the OSD. There is a CLS RGW module that does most of this bucket index work. Um, they're, they're done as transactions, and there's some extra logging that happens inside the OSD. So that all happens in CLS RGW. Um, and for the representation of objects themselves, uh, we have what's called a head object, uh, which is named based on the, the object's name. And that contains attributes about the object. Uh, it also stores the first chunk of the object's data. And it has what's called a, a manifest. And the manifest talks about how the rest of the object's data is striped across uh, the different tail objects in Rados. Uh, by default, we, we stripe objects uh, across four megabyte uh, stripes. And as Ali mentioned, the, the garbage collection is cleaning up these tail objects after the, the head is deleted. So a lot of the stuff you can find in RGW Rados, that H and that CC. And as I mentioned, the, the bucket index stuff is all in CLS RGW. Great. Um, and as the diagram shows, uh, the next step would be Librados and well into the Ceph cluster. That is territory we are not going to get into uh, for this presentation. Um, but now that we're done, uh, does anyone have any questions on what was previously covered? Uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, so how uh, how does RGW get the object layout? Uh, it queries monitor or? 
like what's the uh, workflow for getting an object or given an object ID? How does it reduce it layout? Uh, so we're, we're talking about the like the an S3 object inside a bucket. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. So to look up an object, we we search for its head object by name, and if if it exists, we'll find it there, and then we can read some attributes about it, and it contains a manifest that talks about where all of the rest of the data is. So it's the oh. the head object that lets you find the rest of it. Okay, okay, and uh, uh, so um, I read that bucket index is uh, stored in OMAP, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, is bucket metadata also stored with that uh, in Blue Store? The the bucket metadata is stored in a separate metadata pool as uh, just raw Arados objects, so that's not in OMAP. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, sorry, uh, one basic question. So what exactly are the your queries uh, monitors for? So, so to get the bucket layout or? Basically nothing independent of yeah. our basic Rados. So I think that we, we imply that that was the case, but basically Rados uses the monitors to identify the locations of objects in the cluster, and it does talk to them, to the monitors to send um, perf counters and other and other data. Or is that, sorry, is that going straight to the manager, Casey? Perf okay, counters so go to the manager, but um, RGW is a LibRados client, and the first oh, step of all. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it gets it. So, yeah, it, it sets up a monitor client and it, and it, and it gets a cluster map and it, and it gets updates on those. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, since future talks are going to uh, jump into some of these subsystems uh, that are on the slide, I was wondering if there's anything that the people um, on the on Blue Jeans right now would like to see specifically, um, like any subsystems you'd really like us to touch on first, um, or how you'd like the format um, for one of the presentations on one of these subsystems to go. Uh, would you want code walkthroughs? Would you want us to see us actually run it in a Ceph cluster? Um, if possible, would you like to see us try to go through a bug fix that occurred in it? Um, any any input would be helpful. Uh, maybe uh, just my opinion, probably going through a couple of ops would be uh, helpful. Okay. Uh, you mean like going like all the way up and down into a put, put or get yes. request? Just be a big one or two, probably uh, one main op and then just in the uh, code, code walkthrough. Yeah. That's yeah, a good okay. idea, yeah. Yeah. I could probably turn that around fairly quickly. Um, well, if there, anyone else has any other ideas, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this presentation uh, and Casey for presenting some of these slides and helping me out with the PowerPoint. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone at more presentations and I will make sure to post the presentation today. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, Thanks Ali. Thanks, Ali.